This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife Podcast as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you along here today. So, given that it's kind of spring, some of you may be dealing with beaver issues, so going to be talking about how to do beaver pipes today. So I thought this would be of interest to many of you in the wildlife control industry and perhaps those of you in the pest control industry, you might be interested in some alternative methods of handling beaver conflicts. But before I get to that, want to just sort of introduce myself, of course, if we'd love to hear from you in terms of comments, suggestions for the show, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you, criticisms, yeah, but we'll take those too, but we'll be uh, happy to hear from you if you have ideas for shows, if you have people that you'd like me to interview, products perhaps to review, uh, if you have something to sell, uh, no, no charge to come onto the show. If it's something that we think will fit our audience, we would love to, to have a chat with you and make a, make a time to uh, perhaps do a Zoom meeting and record that for a future vodcast. So hope you subscribe, Pest Geek Podcast, of course, and also my show, Living the Wildlife. Wanted to, This is a show designed to provide research-based information on all things wildlife control uh, for the industry to try to get a little geeky here because we are the Pest Geek Podcast. And so we're going to get into some of the weeds and uh, would love to hear your opinion on it. All right, let's get back on to the topic for today. We're talking about beavers. Castor canadensis, a scientific name, of course. It's the largest native rodent uh, in the United States and I believe Canada as well. So uh, it can grow to 60 pounds or more depending on how many years they're allowed to live. And uh, they can be, they're an incredible, an incredible animal because of their engineering capabilities. Of course, beavers cause conflicts based on not only the tree cutting that they do, but also the flooding that they can do. And then there's a third kind of damage where they can undermine embankments because of the way they tunnel, sometimes to create bank dens. We call them bank beaver, bank denning beaver. So not all the lodges uh, that beavers have are in the middle of the little of the pond. Sometimes they're lodging against the side of a of a river side of a stream side of a pond they're not always in the middle of the pond like you see in so many of those classic photos so the biggest issue of course is tree damage not really going to talk about tree damage today we're going to talk about flooding and so that brings us to the main issue when you're dealing with someone who's complaining about beavers a lot of people respond we got too many beavers right it's a very simplistic approach and of course I think I've had another podcast we talked about uh, it's not about the numbers of animals right so that's often a misnomer we have to make sure we distinguish between the problem and the animal for example the analogy that I use if you haven't heard it already and that is if you have a a farmer who says yeah get we have too many deer and then what are the deer doing well they're eating my corn If you can stop the deer from eating the corn, it doesn't matter how many deer there are. Okay, solve the problem, stop looking for a body count. All right, another analogy would be, we have too many squirrels, what are the squirrels doing? Well, they're in my house. Your job is not to eliminate all the squirrels in the neighborhood, your job is to get rid of the squirrels in the house. That doesn't necessarily mean that you tra- have to trap and kill. Nothing wrong with trapping and killing. I'm not criticizing it. I'm not an animal rights protest industry activist. Okay, those of you who've followed me for a while know full well I welcome opportunities to debate the animal rights protest industry. Okay, they are an anti environmental, anti human organization. Okay. So uh, they have roots that go back into fascism. All right, so that's just the, that's what I believe. But as wildlife control operators, our job is to solve a problem, not to stack up a body count. OK, 
Okay. So with beavers, you have to ask the same question. When someone says they're having problems with beavers, that is too vague. You can drive a truck through that. So the question is, what exactly is the problem that they're having? If they're saying tree damage, what is the tree damage caused by? Is it simply the cutting that they're complaining about? Or is it the flooding that the beavers are doing are threatening a stand of trees? That's a difference. Okay, you may say, well, that's a pretty subtle difference. Yes, it's a subtle difference, but it's a true difference because beaver tend not to cut trees beyond 50 meters of the, of the stream. So there's a limit to how much they're actually going to cut down. However, Flooding can cover a whole lot more acreage than that, okay? So if flooding is the issue, that's a separate issue from the cutting of the trees, right? You can kill trees by flooding them. So what you're trying to do is find out from the client what exactly is the problem. And if they're saying flooding, that they're worried that the flooding is going to affect maybe the uh, septic tank system, maybe it's going to flood across the road, maybe it's going to flood too much acreage, but they kind of like the beaver, but they just wish there wasn't so much flooding. That's the situation for dealing with beaver pipes. Beaver pipes or beaver deceivers, they're called by different things, are basically mechanical devices that you're installing into the dam that allows water to flow through and helps maintain a level of water that you can tolerate. Now, understand that if you get the stream back to where it was before, the beavers are going to have to move on and build a dam somewhere else. The client has to be able to tolerate some levels of flooding. But if they're okay with maybe the pond being a little smaller than what it is now, or the stream or the impoundment a little smaller than it is now, or maybe they can tolerate a little larger, that's fine too, that's even better, then they could be a candidate for a beaver pipe and they have to be able to tolerate tree cutting. If they can so that's the first step. The second step you have to make sure is that there's enough room there to handle spring flooding because the beaver pipes are not gonna be able to handle the additional water flow in the spring. It's gonna take time, just like you have spring flooding even when there's no beaver there. When spring flooding occurs, obviously the beaver pipe is not just going to go magically larger and allow more water to flow through. Obviously, it's silly, okay? So if the client, in other words, if you're in a sensitive area where there is simply no room for additional water in those periods of heavy rainfall or spring runoff, then a beaver pipe can maybe not be the right situation for those. Third issue is if the dam is in an area where the people or situations below the dam are at risk, such as let's say you're dealing with a dam well upstream and maybe there's a steep gradient and perhaps there's a, a road below or perhaps structures below that a catastrophic collapse of the dam would be life-threatening or endanger infrastructure, the, the beaver pipe may not be the solution because you may not want to tolerate a dam there in the first place. Okay, so you have to have those three things obtained in order to properly use a beaver pipe. So let me go over that again. You, your client has to be able to handle some tree cutting. The, the site needs to be able to handle some expansion of flooding during heavy rainfall or spring runoff. And then third, the dam cannot be located in an area where the dam's presence is of itself a threat because in case there's a catastrophic blowout of the dam, that infrastructure or lives might be at risk. Now, I don't want to overemphasize the, 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 the catastrophic blowout. That's very rare. However, it does happen. So... You need to be sure you ask those three questions before you're dealing with the beaver pipe. So a lot of places, of course, the, 
those streams are flowing are very uh, low angled the catastrophic blowout is going to be highly unlikely and if it does the water is just not going to have that vol the, the momentum of going downhill to really throw blow stuff out right so keep that in mind those are the three principles so why do i talk about this because too many times people are trapping beaver and killing beaver because you're not really going to be able to translocate them right i doubt many states would even allow that and there's some issues with that in terms of humaneness. If you've listened to another podcast about translocation, that's an issue. However, the channel, the issue is, is that we can solve the flooding problem with pipes without having to kill the beaver. And this technique is not used enough. Why? Because a lot of wildlife control operators, A, haven't been exposed to it. They don't trust it. It's the same problem we had when I talked about years ago using one-way doors to get rid of squirrels out of action. I had guys, oh, they're just going to chew all the way back in and just create a second hole. My client, i got to kill that thing. And now, after all these years, people are starting to come around saying, hey, you know, this one-way door thing actually works. And again, it's not about that killing beavers is wrong, but we want to be starting to think about better ways or giving our clients informed choice about their options. And this also has the benefit of having continuing revenue because you have to maintain the beaver pipes. At least on an annual basis, perhaps even visiting twice a year is what you're going to have to do. So many of you may have heard, let's go to the screen here. Let's. Many of you may have heard about the Clemson Beaver Pond Leveler. This is obviously the, one of the early ones that was done. This is the one you're going to see in a lot of the research literature. Why? Because it's the oldest and it was the first one done. It's basically a very, let me show you a picture of it here. This is what it looks like. Let me kind of blow that up for you. Scroll down. Get this particular document gives you all the parts. Now look at this device. It's kind of pretty. But it's a pain to make. I am not recommending that you use this. Can you use this? Absolutely. And so you can see the leveling portion of it because the height of the pipe at this end and the left hand end, that elbow, shows that'll be the level that the pond will ultimately get to. That's what the leveling, that's why it's called the Clemson leveler. Okay? You would insert it through the dam, it doesn't have to be that high, that low per se, but you're going to insert it through, install it, and notice the screen around the pipe that prevents beavers from hearing any noise and feeling the rush of water so that they don't dam it up, okay? it's There's plenty of literature out there to show you how to build them, and you can use multiple models and that sort of thing, and so the information's out there. Look at all the parts you're going to have to have in order to construct this. It can take you hours to do it, okay? Not recommending it, but I want you to be aware of it because you may have people say, I want a Clemson leveler, and here's some diagrams. Just do a little Google search, Clemson leveler plan, and this will come up. It's not a big deal, right? But it is a big deal to build it, so make sure you're going to charge enough to build one of these to, if a client wants you to build it, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. There are other th products, for example, when you have beaver damming up culverts now beavers like to dam perpendicular to the water flow so if you're looking at the video here if the water flow is coming this way they like to dam like this notice our beaver deceiver here this is one from sonomish county in washington state notice how it has a triangle Form. So the beaver are going to, let me blow this one up too. So the beaver are going to dam against the front here, but they don't like to go at an angle to the water because the water flow is going up and down here. If I can just sort of create this little, the water is going to flow the way my blue marker is there. They're not going to be damming over here to the right. It's very hard for them to do that. So it confuses them. They don't know how to handle it. That's why you have this sort of triangular look. And so it's a way to protect the culvert, allows water flow, even if the beavers try to dam it up. Now, if, it, if they're really aggressive beavers, you can put pipes 
those PVC pipes through the fencing out into the deeper pond. That way, even if they dam up around the fence, you're still getting water flow through it. And again, you're always, when you're dealing with beavers, beavers dam on the basis of water flow and primarily noise. If they hear noise, they got to bury that. That's just how they're wired. That's why the, you don't, when you're going to a beaver pond area, you don't hear this rush of water, hearing this rush of water like a rapids, right? Beaver go nuts with that. And how do they know this? Well, they did some research where they had some beaver uh, in, in a room and they took a speaker and they had rushing water and the beaver took items in the room and buried the speaker. Pretty pretty interesting experiment right that's just how they're wired so but they're also gauged on flow if they feel movement of water they may react to that as well so this is why you want these triangular deceivers and the culvert of course is at the bottom of your screen to be as large as possible because the more surface area the more likely you're going to have water flow through now as great as beaver deceivers are this is for culverts. There is an environmental issue with these devices. Namely, it can block turtles and other aquatic animals from using, from getting through. So even when you're using hog panels, which I believe are four inches by four inches, I believe, if memory serves, a little bit larger maybe, obviously a turtle that's larger than that can't get through. So you're gonna stop the movement of animals and maybe force those turtles over the road. So there is a way to help address that, and that is you create a gap between the culvert and the fence to allow beaver, to allow those animals to get away around. But there's still some work. So every, every solution has a downside, right? Fencing, people think, oh, it's humane, it's so wonderful. Not always, sometimes it actually stops animal movement and can cause other injuries. Fences aren't purely non-lethal they're less lethal because animals do get killed on fencing okay and this can certainly happen with turtles and other aquatic animals that are too large to fit through the screen okay so there's no free lunch here all right something to think about but anyways this is from skip lyle skip lyle is a gentleman from maine he did a lot of work with some of the uh, native americans up in maine and he built his out of wood they're beautiful to look at if you ever have a chance to see it so he was a early adopter of one of these techniques and uh so this is one of his designs here all right let's go to another one here's one that uses a large screen and basically creates a tube a large screen tube that's inserted into the culvert and that provides the deceiver for water to go through okay you can use this for culverts or you can use it on the dam itself but typically they're often used for culverts okay and notice the meshing here it's 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters so you're looking at somewhere around six six inches by six inches there centimeters two and a half so maybe more like seven uh seven inches square here so again you still have that barrier to larger turtles that can't get through but this is another type of design here and you can put this through a dam or you can use it inside of a culvert as well okay just another version of that these are all online if you want to care to look at them okay this is the one I want you to pay more attention to, and I'm gonna put you in touch with a company out of Massachusetts that has a video that I would highly recommend if you're looking to get into this. They've put in a lot of beaver pipes. Some of you may have recalled, that those of you who live in the Northeast, in 1996, the citizens of Massachusetts decided to listen to the animal rights protest industry and ban so-called cruel traps. And so what happened was, at that moment, we lost uh, we never had snares, but snares were lost by statute now. We lost footholds uh, by statute. We, we had them, we had padded jaw. We had never had footholds for decades that were steel jaw, but padded jaw was considered to be a different device by the state Supreme Court. That's what spawned the animal rights people to say, oh, we're going to shut all this down. And they also banned the use of cona bears unless it was a, uh, a health or safety issue. And then you had to apply for a permit to get it from the health department. Now, what does the health department know about beaver? That's a great question. So all beaver at that point afterwards had to be caught with cage traps. 
and so that's when that's where I got experience using the Bailey and the Hancock and other trappers did as well and also the work got into using beaver pipes so that you didn't have to trap beaver in the first place this was one of the products that came out of some of that work uh, the organization that sort of came up with this design, I believe they may have invented it themselves. Here's a picture, another picture of that beaver baffler. I told you about the screen being used in a culvert. That's another way of doing it as well. But the company was called, called Pioneer Valley Wetland Volunteers, Ruth, Mike and Ruth Callahan. And we'll be, they have their own company now, and I'll be highlighting them here shortly. But being in Massachusetts, here's another example where I show you could put pipes through the screen near a culvert in case they dammed up around it. Notice there's a curving of it. So this is another way to allow, uh, even if the beavers dam up along the fence, water's still getting through. And I hope that's sort of a pic good picture for you to kind of get a mental image of it. Okay, so they became basically experts in the, in the area of creating beaver pipes in Massachusetts. And so... Uh, they, along with Don LaFountain, some of you may know Don LaFountain. Don LaFountain also had his own company, and he did a lot of work with, with uh, railroads and because there's a lot, of, a lot of bridges. Railroads need to have, make sure that their railroads are safe and protected from flooding because it's a problem. And so he kind of got some big contracts with them and became quite proficient at installing these devices. So my point is, is not that these devices are suitable in every location. I'm not saying that, okay? We're professionals here. We understand nuance. Just like you don't use a conibear everywhere, doesn't mean the conibear is a bad trap. It just means it doesn't belong everywhere. And same way with a cage trap. A cage trap doesn't belong everywhere, okay? Same way with this particular device. These pipes are not to be used everywhere, but I'm arguing here we need to be using them far more often than just simply trap and kill. We need, to have, we need to step up our game here, folks. And some of our clients want to have the option. Give your client the option of an alternative. Okay, there's a lot of benefits with having beaver ponds in terms of wildlife, in terms of lack of ero shutting down erosion, raising water tables, helping a variety of things. There's some downsides with beaver dams, okay? But there, the point is, is that we can tolerate a lot more beaver dams than what we have. And so sometimes people just get this knee-jerk reaction, we've got to kill it, and, it's, and that's just simply inappropriate as a professional. So what this pipe is, of course, is you're using plastic corrugated piping, okay, pretty flexible, and you're cutting it through the dam, and then you're installing a pipe at the other end underneath the water, and it's obviously it's just using gravity flow to go through, just like if you take a straw and you suck on it a little bit and put it over the edge of your glass, it'll keep flowing and the same thing happens here, okay? And that's how it works. And if the water gets too low, it'll stop working. Of course, then you don't have a flooding problem anymore. If the water begins to raise back up, it'll start flowing, it'll start flowing through again. Now, they need to be maintained, obviously, because, you know, freezing weather, if the, if the ice comes in and you have a really a deep freeze of ice can damage this you may have debris getting trapped in it so on at least a, an annual would be a minimum or maybe biannual twice a year you need to monitor these to be sure that they're still in working con condition and there are any repairs that need to be made and this sort of thing now I need to point out one other issue many states have restrictions on disturbing beaver dams so I want you, before you get all excited here, you need to take the time and contact your Fish and Wildlife Department. You may, uh, you may want to, there may be an environmental agency in your state as well, depending on where you're at, and find out what the permitting process is for installing beaver pipes through land. Because you will need to have, you will have to cut the dam to install the pipe, and that's disturbing the dam. And many states have wetlands laws that prohibit you doing that without a permit. I know a lot of people go out there with backhoes, and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff with dams, and they're not often permitted. I understand that. You should not be that person. Places like Massachusetts, this can be a problem. I don't know if they've changed that regulation for beaver pipes or not. 
but you need to be sure you as a business owner are doing everything on the right way. So you want to, as you're researching this, you're going to have to do some groundwork before you begin selling it to make sure all of your ducks are in a row. And get that worksheet out and basically have your steps. Is the, can the t client tolerate some tree damage? Can the t client tolerate a little bit of flooding even with the pipe? Uh, is the dam in a sensitive location that threatens health and human safety and infrastructure? In other words, if there's a blowout of that dam, is there going to be a, a life crisis here? Do you need permitting to put to cut the dam to put to install the pipe? You need to have all that in your know that before you begin installing this. Then you start pricing out the equipment. Okay, so this is one view of one of these particular pipes that but the newer design is different than even this and we'll talk about that in a moment so you can see this is pretty simple right in fact it's even the one I'm going to talk about here is going to be even simpler than this you don't have to go out and get these huge waders to go out in the middle it's actually you float the object out into the middle of the pond and then sink it okay so it's it's amazing what you can do with this okay so let's go to the next picture here I'm going to bring you to my website this is a uh, could take you here whoops let me take you to my website here uh, let's go here all right we're gonna scroll down There it is, okay? This company here, I did a review of their video, and you can look it up under Beaver, Best Beaver Management Practices at the Wildlife Control Consultant website. Companies called Beaver Solutions. I don't make any money on my endorse on my talking about this, but this is a 2010 video. I did a little review on it. I talk about the contents of it. Here's one of their pipes through the through an area here. Uh, this is this is one from Wiki, Wikipedia, sorry, but theirs is much more sophisticated than this. I talk about what they deal with and I provide what I have as a couple of criticisms. These are not devastating criticisms, they're just a couple of things I wish that the video discussed a little bit more. And then I have some concluding comments and then I talk about what it costs. Their video at that time in 2010 was about $25 plus about six bucks shipping. I'm sure shipping has gone up because priority mail is a little bit higher now. And that's basically it. So let's take a look at their site. It's called Beaver Solutions. And this is where they talk about their specialty. They go into specifically how to take care of beaver flooding issues. And this is their white here, pretty site here, pretty, pretty, pretty neat. And so here they talk about fence and pipe devices Here's one of their fences. Here's them. There's Don LaFountain there floating out one of their cages. And so this is the cage now that holds the, the corrugated pipe. And then they will float it out and then sink it. And this will drop to the bottom of the pond, allowing water to get into that pipe. But the beavers can't fill it up because it's going to be at the bottom. And they're not going to feel the water, the water flow there. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing, and there's another example of their of their work there. Here's some photos. Friends, what struck me about this is how simple it was. I am not a handy person, right? Now, so that's one of the ways I get criticized in this industry is, oh, Stephen, you're just an academic. Yeah, uh, that's true. I'm a little bit more of an academic. Uh, there's a lot of things I'm not necessarily good at when it comes to working with my hands, just like you may not be able to type as fast as I do doesn't make you a bad person just because I don't have the skills with tools doesn't make me a bad person we all have different skills here and my my skill is reading and writing and research and trying to teach so yeah there's some truth to the fact that those who can do those who can't teach yes there's certain things I can't do especially now with my age and some of my body issues uh, it would be hard for me to do some of that so I want to help you do your job better and expose you to different things. And this is a company I have a lot of respect for. And I think their video for 30 bucks or so is well worth purchasing 
and learning what their system is, how they build these devices. And you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh my goodness, why haven't I thought of that? My bottom line here is if we're going to expand our business and expand our opportunities, this is one area where you can service a client and they'll have that client on a long-term basis because you're going to set up a contract where you're going to constantly monitor that particular device and check on it. Now, there's one more thing before I go. There are situations where even when you install a beaver pipe, you may have some very aggressive beaver that are damming everything up in sight. Because one of the challenges is if you f drop that water level down too far, the beaver may just simply move downstream or move upstream and dam there. And then you have another dam going on. So you have to be careful how far you're dropping the water level. Okay, you need to let your client know. But if you have a situation where the beaver are just incredibly aggressive, sometimes you'll need to trap the adults. So you would have your traps far away from the lodge, maybe up along the dam, maybe elsewhere, and try to trap the adults. And then the young, if the young are mature enough, they don't have the same dam building skills, and things can kind of settle down. That's a fallback in case the damming gets really aggressive. But again, I'm a big fan of Beaver Solutions. No, I don't make any money off of this. So if you think I'm just trying to hawk their product and get a commission, it's not true. Uh, I'm happy to take the money if they're offering it, but I'm not. I, they don't even know I'm doing this right now, right? So I'm just saying if you're interested in learning more about this, there's a lot of information online of different types of designs. If you visit my website, you'll probably see some links to it as well. But if you're going to just get a one-stop area for putting in beaver pipes through dams, and I think they deal with some culvert stuff too here. Here's their culvert stuff. There's that triangular design. I'll give you some photos on that. Look at it. How, much, how easy is it to, to install that, right? Now, what you're going to need to do is monitor here because ice, if you have a freeze up, ice is going to damage this fence. So you want to build it strong. Okay, there's some other designs there. And it's, you know, we need to be doing this, guys. We need to be offering cities and towns options because dams inside of culverts are dangerous. So let me tell you something. If you're going to, let me close with this. If you're in a situation where the culvert's already been dammed, you had better be extraordinarily careful how you're going to unplug that if you do it at all. You can drown with a catastrophic blowout there. You may be like, oh, I'm just going to pick at it because you're probably going to try to come at it from downstream, right? Because the water level is lower. And you're going to like, oh, I'm going to take a little hook and I'm just going to try to get it started. Well, you may pull the wrong, the, the wrong stick and the whole thing goes. And now you have this wall of water coming at you and you're not going to, you're not going to muscle through that, my friend. Okay, there's no way. There's a lot of force behind that and it can kill you. So don't do it alone, and you want to try to do this from a situation where you're upstream and you, uh, I don't know if there's any real protocol on this, but I would maybe be thinking about having a rope tied on you and that people, that you'd have a life preserver on and that you'd have people really keyed in and paying, paying attention because when that, if that thing gives out, you could be sucked away, okay, and drown. So uh, be, I'm just telling you, be extraordinarily careful with this if you do it at all, all right? I would love to hear from someone who has a lot of experience doing culvert, uh, removing dams from culverts. I would love to hear about it because I think that's an area of our industry that we need a lot more uh, training in and research because I don't think anyone's done it yet. So beaver pipes, they're not the solution to everything. But I think they're another tool we need to have in our toolbox, and I want to encourage you to consider it. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast. Take a time, take a few moments, subscribe to our podcast, visit us on Facebook, join our community at Pest Geek Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Have thoughts, comments, reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, this is, uh, we want you to, to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. So take care, everyone.